Thank you very much for introduction and interest in my ongoing research. So today I would like to present you a sort of ongoing project uh, that I currently uh, conduct. Um, as you see from the title, it's about Ukraine and the kind of effects of uh, Russia's war against Ukraine on its business community, on Ukrainian corporate uh, world. And uh, I'm particularly interested, uh, or what I actually have detected is uh, changes in the uh, business behavior to what's more a kind of social and human uh, components. Uh, and so today I will talk about the sort of patterns in these adaptation strategies, uh, but also implications uh, and courses of these um, um, kind of adaptation strategies, which I conceptually call business autonomy. So let me start um, with certain motivation for this research. And first of all, probably um, you all have uh, to deal with the uh, challenges that Russia's war against Ukraine brought uh, to our research agendas. Uh, so research on uh, Ukraine, but also on Russia and post-Soviet uh, countries uh, has been troubled, if not made impossible. And uh, also some traditional paradigms became to be a less useful, if not obsolete. Uh, but at the same time, this a kind of new situation, this war brought new ideas and new research questions to our agendas. And uh, so in my case, I wonder it kind of in, in the face of this war, of this crisis, what was the reaction of Ukrainian business? Have they adapted to the current situation and actually have to understand what kind of patterns can we observe there? And uh, if uh, kind of the, there are certain patterns in these adaptation strategies, then uh, what are the causes and what lessons we potentially can learn for uh, discussions on Ukraine uh, rebuilding and reconstruction. And this is practically the questions that I want to discuss with you today uh, in my uh, talk. So for the agenda, I actually proceeded in an uh, um, inductive way. So, uh, and this is uh, uh, how I will also organize my talk today. So first of all, I started with the rea reality on the ground. What is happening in the uh, in Ukraine's corporate world? How uh, do they voice their interested attitudes and how do they react uh, to uh, to the war? And I'm particularly tried to um, compare the strategies um, along two groups of Ukrainian corporates. Uh, those one who are usually regarded as a sort of oligarchic big business, uh, uh, business that have strong legacies in post-Soviet or transition period in Ukraine, and then um, those one uh, that could be regarded as a sort of innovative economy, mainly this is tech business. And uh, then I as a kind of second step, I will proceed with um, more academic part with research questions and theoretical approaches to understand this reality. Uh, and uh, there I will talk about what kind of concepts or the operationalization one can apply to the uh, current reality and what kind of causal explanations uh, could be suggested. So first of all, let me start with a short background. Um, so um, it's uh, well known that Ukraine economy has a strong share of so-called legacy or oligarchic economy. Uh, here I just uh, gave you the index of chronic capitalism that is uh, performed by The Economist. And uh, you see uh, Ukraine ranked uh, at the position five. Uh, so, um, in comparison, it means that um, the um, great shares of corporates in Ukraine uh, make their 
businesses in the sectors where you uh, do not need to have comparative market advantage, but you rather need to have good uh, connections to political elites. Yeah, so uh, it's not because you have a, a kind of better product or a cheaper or more technological product that would bring you profit, but rather uh, whether you have uh, a better proximity to the state. And uh, on the uh, uh, other side of the slide, you see that uh, actually even this economy was pretty dynamic in the recent years. So one, once uh, this business was uh, located in such uh, sectors as energy, metal, finance, and retail, uh, we have uh, in the trend that new businesses uh, that uh, were coming from, for example, agriculture, food, real estate, or IT and investment joined uh, the group of this a kind of um, legacy economy. Although uh, with IT, it's of course the question that probably it's not the legacy, but rather uh, here on this slide, it shows that we have a kind of new um, uh, part of the economy uh, in Ukraine. So overall, there are a lot of discussions about oligarchs in Ukraine. In fact, uh, in a kind of its share in Ukrainian economy is not so large. Uh, according to several estimations, here I just took the um, numbers from uh, most recent the oligarchization report of one uh, economic uh, think tank in Ukraine. Uh, we see that uh, the a kind of the share of uh, oligarchic business as regards asset and turnout were approximately 16%. And actually, over the years, it is uh, even a kind of uh, decreasing. And uh, the share of labor, so the share of employees that are um, uh, working on oligarchic enterprises is also uh, not so big. So the structural power of oligarchic business in Ukraine's economy, uh, in other words, is not so uh, high. Uh, and it rather roots uh, in its political connections and its political influence. So uh, the other coin of the medal uh, is that over the recent years we have um, uh, innovative tech economy on the rise in Ukraine. And here I also uh, give you a, um, a kind of several uh, data uh, for uh, to, to illustrate this trend. So uh, the um, blue, uh, dark blue uh, numbers are here for uh, share of uh, this tech business uh, in GDP, in, in exports in GDP, then the uh, light blue is for a uh, share in the total services of exports. And then we have also the number uh, of employed in the gray uh, scale. And so you see the trend is up. Uh, also, uh, the overall tech uh, business uh, constitutes approximately 4% of Ukrainian GDP. Um, this is upwards trend. Okay, so here again, you see uh, that also the number of IT companies increased over the years greatly. So there are different estimations, but it's approximately 2.5 uh, to 5,000 uh, IT companies that are uh, registered or estimated as working in Ukraine according to different um, uh, approaches. And uh, as regards uh, a kind of the degree of innovation of these companies, this is the second slide. We, of course, have uh, companies that are probably less innovative because they uh, work in the product oriented sphere, but then there is a kind of great share and it's on increase uh, of service oriented or R&D uh, uh, IT companies. And uh, the same is true for the number of employees. So it's uh, uh, it's growing from year to year. Also, um, since uh, the end of the last year, uh, it's um, a little bit uh, um, a kind of in decrease, or uh, at least in stalemate. And uh, what's particular about this innovative economy is that uh, it uh, also it, it um, uh, is active 
beyond the state. So it's like it, it try not to be incorporated in the states, but uh, uh, in the state agencies and so on. But in the recent years, we still see a kind of some um, uh, projects where there was cooperation of this innovative economy with the state agency, in particular in um, the sphere uh, or in the course of so-called uh, digitalization reforms in Ukraine. And one of the uh, these projects is uh, AppDIA, uh, where we have a kind of the uh, a certain kind of e-bureaucracy that was introduced through this app in Ukraine. And uh, we have, uh, the, there is, so uh, this DIA has a lot of sections and one of these sections is to organize or to provide the platform for working of uh, several IT companies. And we see that many of them used this uh, kind of space provided uh, to them or to a certain extent also created by them in cooperation with the state. Okay, and um, is this um, uh, an, another kind of interesting uh, trend with this uh, innovative economy is that it's uh, it also cooperate with other sectors of the economy and here you see that uh, uh, the range of sectors of the economy that in one or another way um, em either employ sal salaried IT professionals or outsource their uh, ICT tasks to uh, tech companies um, is is substantial, yes, and it's growing. So, and then there is practically no actually um, particular focus, but rather it's uh, this trend is across different sectors of the economy, and uh, also not at the high level, but uh, regarded as very highly potential to grow is the IT cooperation with uh, agro industry in Ukraine, and so there are several um, kind of projects that. Uh, try to increase the efficiency of agro industry in Ukraine, and they are regarded as very much innovative and successful. So now uh, to the current situation of war. Um, you probably uh, have a, an educated guess that the war brought um, great damage, uh, and so consequently there would be a very a strong uh, or high needs as regards um, uh, capital that would need uh, uh, to be there for recovery and reconstruction. And uh, here, uh, just uh, uh, the data from one uh, of the recent reports of the World Bank, uh, it uh, was published just um, last month in March. And uh, so it's practically estimate what kind of total damages, which means uh, direct costs of the war um, are there. And uh, um, uh, here the share of, of corporate world is not so big, it's green. So for your understanding, but at the same time, the share of losses, so the sort of indirect costs, is pretty high. And then again, the total recovery and reconstruction that would be needed uh, for agriculture, for commerce, industry, and service uh, is about 50% in the uh, total amount uh, as of four, um, uh, 411 US billion. Um, so on the one side, uh, the, the, there are high damages, but it seems that uh, uh, industry and IT sector uh, is rather targeted by a kind of indirect losses and not so much by uh, direct damages. So let us look more precisely on economic damage and loss um, along these two groups of um, businesses. And here um, are data for Ukrainian big businesses uh, that are kind of situated in this legacy economy. Uh, here you see on the left side, uh, assets, production, uh, capacities, and storage uh, damages uh, for several enterprises that belongs to certain uh, big business groups. Um, and um, the yellow are the lowest uh, in 2022, while the uh, um, blue one, uh, blue parts are the uh, losses in 2014. And you see that depending 
of course, on, geogra uh, on geographical positioning of one or another enterprise. Uh, some losses uh, have been happening to this business already in 2014 or since 2014, while some new losses uh, were caused uh, since 2022. And uh, of course, there are uh, fluctuations, but rather kind of uh, uh, drop in the wealth as regards dynamics of uh, uh, assets belonging to big business and uh, on the right, a side of the slide, you see how this fluctuation looked like um, uh, for each of um, um, a kind of oligarchic as or rich uh, businessmen in Ukraine. Um, as regards uh, losses of IT business, um, it's uh, until now, I should say, uh, they were not so high. Uh, so there were certain decrease in the export volumes uh, and uh, changes in the export uh, comparing to uh, uh, corresponding period in 2021. Uh, but overall, um, in comparison with all other uh, industries, uh, computer sciences, a kind of IT uh, businesses uh, had even uh, approximately 10% here, 9.9 .9 on the left, uh, on the right side, um, um, a kind of um, positive trend, yes. Um, yeah, and um, we, we will see how it will look like um, um, for year 2023. There are some predictions that it would not be so good anymore, uh, but at least in this first year, um, the losses were minor. So how have these businesses uh, responded or adapted to Russia's war, to their losses, to the changes in the context of their uh, operational activities? Um, let me uh, start with a sort of preferences and attitudes of big business uh, as it was usually um, exemplified uh, in their official statements and here, um, I just give you an example of statements that was um, made by Renat Ahmedov, uh, shareholder of the main and the only one shareholder of SKM investment company. And uh, so here you will see that he's talking about uh, our common goal, uh, the victory and survival of Ukraine, and that everyone must do everything in their power to strengthen their country. Uh, government, uh, business, and each every Ukrainian citizen should do then every possible for the victory. And uh, he also pointed to particular role of business. Business must play its role and help the state. And uh, he also pointed to uh, a kind of social component here, saying that our biggest value is people, and so the activities of enterprises should be directly to support people to a kind of uh, to decrease their suffering and help them to accommodate to the crisis. Um, then uh, it. Um, so the reactions of big business uh, were not limited just to uh, a kind of simple words. These were not only uh, um, declarations without implementation. So there were a kind of practical implementations of uh, what was declared um, almost by all businesses, big businesses in Ukraine. And first of all, we solve um, activities that were directed to support the state. Um, either via paying uh, taxes fully, despite uh, the losses in uh, uh, kind of storages and uh, production capacities, or despite the fact that some enterprises had just to stop their activities. Uh, many paid their taxes in February 2022, even in advance for the whole year, just to uh, kind of provide financial resources to a state. To the state, and then uh, there were a kind of some indirect uh, support of the state. Um, um, for example, when um, um, these big businesses um, finance uh, the equipment for the army, but also for, so for territorial defense structures. 
and uh, there seems to be less capital flight uh, overall in Ukraine, but uh, of course it could be also attributed to restrictions on capital mobility that uh, have been introduced by the National Bank of Ukraine uh, in uh, last year. And then there was also another uh, a kind of part of activities that they were then directed towards Ukrainian population. Uh, and so these were mainly sort of different types of humanitarian aid uh, related to provision of goods uh, to population uh, that um, was still uh, in Ukraine and in some um, dangerous zones uh, or um, a kind of organization of different transfers uh, of population uh, towards more um, safe places or it, all kinds of possible humanitarian aid was there. And uh, Forbes Ukraine actually uh, did a sort of ranking of uh, big businesses and what they, how much they invested and what they did particularly. Uh, and they uh, also do not just take uh, at face what was declared, but they then actually try to calculate uh, what was um, kind of plausibly uh, invested in one or another assistance, either towards the state or towards society. And here you see the rank. As regards IT business, uh, it was uh, the uh, kind of the stance was also pretty much pro-Ukrainian as regards the kind of its public statements. Um, they for here um, one of the IT uh, CEO of IT company um, pointed out that it's time now to uh, give back to your our country. Uh, we want to live in modern and new Ukraine. Um, regarded themselves as responsible business and uh, also a kind of combining this business rationale of earning money, uh, not only for yourself, but for country, for our families and for donations, first of all, to the army. And then also in practical terms, we see that there were the same range of activities. Um, the number, even the number of registered IT uh, companies that paid taxes um, uh, in 2022 uh, increased. Um, this is uh, um, a kind of devoted to the fact that uh, probably some IT uh, entrepreneurs that were um, employed informally at uh, increased the uh, uh, tax rates, uh, I, I mean, uh, amounts that they declare it, uh, amount of money that they earned and declare it to tax officials. Uh, then uh, some of them even joined uh, Ukrainian um, army. Um, here on the uh, right um, upper slide, you see, um, graph, you see uh, that um, um, pro uh, approximately uh, 43 uh, companies um, declared that um, uh, some part up to 5% of the employees joined the army and 25% said that it's between uh, 5 and 15%. And then there was also a kind of special um, um, project, uh, so-called IT army that was organized together with Ukrainian defense ministries and other state uh, agencies. And um, it, it, the idea was that uh, technical uh, specialists help Ukrainian army um, practically to do the, uh, its operations. And so there is a different share of companies uh, depending how many uh, employees were involved in that IT army. Um, overall, there are also other uh, signs of uh, more close cooperation between business and 
uh, IT business and state in Ukraine. We see the increased number of military tech companies um, uh, over the recent year. And then also the, there is the range of um, activities, a kind of spheres where Ukraine military tech is uh, actively developing. These are robotic software for the military and uh, IBVR technologies. Okay, and then um, uh, this business also a kind of directed its activities uh, to a kind of more uh, uh, civil, uh, civic uh, activities and towards society. So there are also donations that are coming from this business. Um, here there was a, a, an attempt to calculate um, how much is um, donated by IT companies. Um, so pretty uh, impressive numbers as well. So and in terms of numbers, 95% uh, of IT companies actually declared that they transferred funds to help the state through donations in one or another form. And uh, in the most cases, uh, uh, so many of them transferred approximately uh, between five and 20% of its um, wages, yes? And uh, uh, approximately 20%, 90.5% even donated more. Okay, and uh, then again, another uh, uh, example of more civic uh, business to state cooperation is again uh, DIA. Uh, app that um, provided certain new wartime services um, to uh, population in Ukraine, both for those one who uh, were in Ukraine and who had to uh, flee Ukraine. And here is a range of different kind of services that uh, were developed uh, or extended in the recent year. Um, Another particularity is that this business uh, tried to organize uh, a sort of business uh, cooperation projects, and this is uh, one uh, so-called UR Tech Network uh, that uh, was organized to help uh, different IT companies to adapt to uh, the current context of the war. And at the moment, it unites 45 companies that kind of help each other uh, to so survive and to uh, overcome the hardnesses of the war-term context. Um, another uh, dimension of this cooperation uh, target education, and so there were um, a kind of the project organized by several IT projects in cooperation with uh, universities and with uh, certain state institutions like its Ministry of Digital Transformation, but also local uh, administrations to uh, prepare more IT uh, specialists um, in intensive educational courses to help uh, the state, for example, with the provision of services through DIA, but um, through, all, uh, through other uh, e-bureaucracy uh, issues. Okay, and then the kind of, uh, until now, I relied on available information or a kind of uh, um, information that was either uh, prepared by certain um, sectoral business associations or uh, businesses themselves, uh, but I also decided to complement it with my own uh, study, and so I do um, semi-structured interviews with uh, several uh, representatives of several Ukrainian companies throughout last year, and uh, so I did not um, um, uh, limited myself to certain sites uh, or sector. So I tried to uh, look for, actually look for positive examples of this adaptation in one another way to, to um, try to find out more about what were the patterns of this successful adaptation and uh, looking for potential causes of this success. And so uh, I um, try to uh, elaborate more on interaction of these companies with different actors or stake uh, uh, stakeholders. And here you see um, how uh, I kind of, what were my focuses? So I looked how the company organized its work 
insight, how it uh, worked with employees, then uh, within business community or associations, uh, probably uh, related to particular sectors, and uh, how it uh, cooperated with local community uh, and uh, local uh, state and administrations, and how it worked with national state, and uh, what about uh, what was external dimension, both in terms of interaction with the donors, but also international um, partners, trade partners, for example. And uh, the results of this pilot study uh, actually um, suggest that we see a pretty good emergency handling skills in the companies uh, to large extent due to the uh, uh, previous experience uh, from the COVID times, but also uh, many of them starting from 2014 uh, developed a kind of emergency plans to deal with potential crisis and potential uh, extension of the conflict uh, from Donbass to other regions. So they had a kind of em emulation plans that uh, they could um, rely upon uh, in the real situation of the war. Uh, then we see that uh, I also detected a lot uh, of instances of business cooperation, uh, even within one sector, um, those ones who compete with each other just a couple of uh, months ago, or even still had uh, the court cases against each other. Uh, the, the, they try to help each other. And uh, so the, there is um, a, a kind of this remarkable uh, cooperative uh, resilience uh, uh, of the government, of uh, the business world there. Uh, but there was a kind of some bad guys there too. They uh, usually attributed to foreign companies so these bad cases. And uh, the other thing is probably interesting for Yelena that uh, this cooperation was not only formal, but uh, really uh, there were a lot of informalities there, but this informality was used in a positive way, yes? so as a way to make things uh, work quickly. And then there was strong social component. First of all, it was limited to so-called club goods. So they were taking care uh, of employees and their families, uh, but uh, they, uh, depending on the size of the companies and capacities, there was also uh, instances where they tried to provide public goods. Um, although uh, in many cases, these goods were rather specialized. Uh, so if this was um, a kind of food producing company, then this company tried to distribute food to the population or donate these uh, uh, products uh, um, for different hum humanitarian initiatives. Or if it was um, a kind of machinery company, then it had little uh, on goods that could be donated for humanitarian aid, and so then it donated money. So these public goods were rather specialized to the uh, sector of activities of one or another company. And then uh, um, some other uh, a kind of trends was that uh, there was uh, this adaptation strategies that had a great share of modernization, either in terms of implementing very quick uh, implementation of projects that were thought through uh, in the company for a long time. Uh, and so uh, this was the time where um, the CEO or managers of the company decided to implement these uh, innovations, and these were either technological innovations or process optimization. And uh, um, so the, the main complaints that I heard actually were about foreign businesses uh, that either stopped uh, their activities and their connections to Ukrainian companies or rather limited their activities to a, a sort of aid uh, and uh, uh, I kind of decided to skip their business commercial um, um, interaction. 
Um, then I also kind of not to uh, this pilot study was of course limited in terms of respondents, although uh, it allowed me to go in depth as regards uh, the strategies of adaptation of businesses, but I also looked up into uh, business surveys that were um, conducted by different associations, and here is one of the uh, uh, surveys conducted by European Business Association uh, after uh, 100 days of the war, and they largely actually supported my uh, results. So they uh, show both um, um, a kind of strong cooperation of business with the state and with the society, and also the social component was uh, visible there. Uh, for example, 63% of companies that were uh, participating in that survey pay declared that they paid full salaries, although only 17 of these companies work at full capacities. Uh, and then uh, this all actually brought me to two empirical puzzles. Uh, so on the one side, you have big oligarchic business uh, out of the southern, uh, but actually, uh, kind of, in, th there were some projects uh, of uh, charity and so on on the side of big businesses in the years before. But the scope that we observed uh, throughout the recent years was very high and remarkable. So they were caring about society and the national state. Uh, uh, although they usually regard it as a kind of rent seeking uh, um, business that is taking care only about its particularistic interest. And then on the other side, we I saw tech business uh, that was actually regarded as very much autonomous, uh, a side of the state uh, that increasingly cooperated and integrated even into the state structures. And uh, so um, the second question I had is how to understand it and uh, how to, uh, what kind of patterns uh, based on theoretical consideration we can um, recognize there. And I turned first of all to those political economy studies that dealt with um, the behavior of business at the moment of crisis. Uh, and here is the differentiation uh, that was uh, suggested for uh, Af African business and it's dealing with the crisis of AIDS and other diseases. Uh, uh, Antoinette Handley, um, a political economist from University of Toronto, suggested uh, this uh, conceptualization in her book. And so she suggests to differentiate between narrow interest and broad interest of business. A narrow interest it's about cost when business cares more about cost efficiency, short signed profit motif. Uh, so it uh, then uh, very competitive uh, in terms of its relationship with other businesses and uh, actually um, in its cost efficiency drive, it can race to the bottom if it is not constrained either by society demands or by certain institutional constraints. And uh, usually uh, this business Business is referred to as sort of immature business that is at the very early age at, of its development. And then the other type of business is um, driven by broad interest, where businesses are publicly minded, means that they um, think about long term development. Uh, uh, and sustainable growth, uh, then it's not only the well being of the company, but the country and the society that drives their business um, activities. Um, and in this, uh, a kind of more broad interest, it's uh, more eager to cooperate with other um, um, companies in provision of public goods uh, to the society and uh, this business is re referred to as more mature one. Uh, actually, this uh, idea um, um, refer to the previous work in political economy that also tried to differentiate between roving and stationary bandits, for example, uh, as um, exemplified here by the framework uh, that was suggested by Mankur also many years ago. 
Um, so these are the sort of same ideas that we see roving bandits more with this narrow business interest and stationary bandit with this broad one. And um, so then conceptually, uh, this interest could be um, described as uh, with the term business autonomy, uh, where business autonomy means uh, uh, the situation where business uh, have this kind of broad interest, uh, where it is more independent from the state uh, pressure, but at the same time, it's also independent from its own particular district interest and so can care about um, uh, the whole society. And uh, this uh, business autonomy then uh, th that is about business preferences, business interest uh, is implemented uh, in reality in certain constructive responses to crisis, uh, either related to the the company operational activities to the workplace or to a kind of uh, interaction of business with um, society or the state um, in its a kind of joint collaborative attempts to mitigate effects and causes uh, of the crisis. And based on this, uh, a kind of conceptual uh, idea of this autonomy, uh, business autonomy and constructive responses, uh, one can uh, create operationalization of business autonomy. So what kind of uh, practical uh, um, activities of business could be referred to as business autonomy? And if we want to say that business autonomy is not either or uh, not, but rather it's about the degree of business autonomy, then one can create the ranking of these constructive positive responses. And here I tried uh, to limit myself to six one, but of course the list is not comprehensive and could be further developed. But it starts, for example, just with a simple uh, announcement of uh, 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 company position as regards the crisis, in our case, the Russian uh, war, or, and it goes to the level of provision of material support at the national level to wider community or national state. And um, then I tried actually to uh, apply this operationalization uh, to the cases of Ukrainian businesses, uh, differentiating between big business and IT business. And you see actually that we uh, have a very constructive responses. So it's not in quantitative, but rather sort of in qualitative terms, but we see constructive responses in both groups of businesses. The differences are very slight. Uh, so IT business uh, had uh, some public statements regarding the war, but they were not uh, a kind of very formal and official, rather these statements, statements were uh, made in interviews or on Facebook, uh, or in kind of uh, informal platforms, and this is probably can be devoted just to uh, to the style uh, of this business, but also to the fact that many of them do not have uh, established PR uh, department and so on. And uh, then in terms of lobbying uh, of national uh, of, uh, or local or foreign governments to respond to the war, we see more uh, sort of activities on the side of big businesses. Uh, I do not exclude that there is something on the side of IT, but uh, at least uh, it's, it's not declared. It's probably it remains in the realm of informality. But, uh, and of course, a big business had better kind of capacities in terms of their political ties, both to national, local, and international elites. And so apparently it was able in the position, uh, better equipped uh, in a better position to um, use these um, ties. And then uh, another difference um, that I was, uh, able to detect in my research that big business uh, was uh, a kind of more cautious in uh, business to business cooperation. So the instances of uh, business to business cooperation uh, were uh, almost non-existent. And um, 
or a kind of just by occasion, but not by a kind of big uh, declared joint action. And there was a lot of a sort of cooperation initiative of business to business on the side of IT. So, uh, and then uh, this uh, bring me enough from question of what and how to question why this all happens. So why do some businesses respond in this substantive way? Uh, also, so, so I mean, I do not rule out that some businesses uh, continue to seek their narrow commercial interests. Uh, but in this uh, stage of the research, I was rather kind of focused uh, on more uh, positive responses on this business that uh, demonstrated these high constructive responses in the context of war. And actually, there are uh, several explanations suggested by research that, and that uh, at first glance could uh, be relevant for the case of Ukrainian businesses as well. And I uh, structure them there along uh, different levels. Yeah? So first you have a level of analysis that relates to context-related explanation, so the context in which business acts. So this is, uh, for example, as a situation of weak states. So if you do not have states that would protect you, you need to step in uh, is the explanation. Uh, and uh, then there is also a kind of more evolutionary explanation that we see certain transformation of business of Ukrainian business community, even in the sector of this big oligarchic business from within. And so we have certain uh, their oligarchization from within that was just, um, for example, because the charity initiatives have been there already many years before, and then that these charity activities just increased um, in, in the context of war. Then we have uh, explanations that uh, are more sectoral one. Uh, so first of all, that um, we have different levels of cronyism and rent seeking, and um, so that at the time of war, uh, many of these uh, crony uh, uh, relationships uh, were irrelevant, uh, and uh, because of uh, uh, probably concentration of power in the hands of uh, military administration or concentration of power in uh, the uh, realm of uh, presidential administration and not every business had good connections to them or so um, here this explanation should be probably deepen it uh, further uh, and more nuances should be uh, a, a kind of elaborated on what change in uh, rent seeking and cronyism uh, according uh, in the war context. Then there are some explanations that suggest that depending on degree of innovation that uh, one or another business um, bring, uh, brings with it, we might have also different uh, level of uh, uh, constructive responses. And then, um, there is also idea that mobility of assets, capital, and labor matters a lot. Um, um, so, because if you cannot move your assets from um, the country so easily, uh, then you are more likely to uh, a kind of to remain and try to um, uh, make everything possible for the victory, uh, or at least for the resistance uh, of the country. Um, I personally think that uh, there is a kind of a lot of gaps in the sectoral level explanations, and in particular, we see that um, actually uh, the constructive uh, responses of businesses cannot be devoted to sectors only. Uh, but nevertheless, these are explanations that probably need a more kind of more detailed elaboration. And then there are uh, form uh, uh, company level explanations that point to the importance of capacities that one or another uh, company has, um, because probably some uh, were not able to contribute anything. They did not have any resources um, to um, say to, to um, 
extend their uh, responses beyond uh, the realm of their uh, employees. Uh, and so their constructive response uh, has been limited then. Uh, and then labor dependency, so whether they depend on highly qualified lay employees or not, uh, and this would be a kind of explanation for the social component uh, in their strategies is another possible explanation and internationalization of business of different kind. So whether business um, uh, is obliged to um, care about or to illustrate, to expose certain level of social responsibility adapted to the war could be also an explanation. So in my current stage of research, I was not able to test all these explanations. So this is rather exemplary uh, list of what could be looked at. And here I'm also uh, happy to have Yelena as my uh, uh, discussant. Uh, so I'm looking forward to your potential suggestions in this regard. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ina, for a very uh, insightful and informative and detailed uh, talk. Yeah, so now, uh, Yelena, please, if you want to comment. Um, in a many thanks for your very interesting presentation um, with so many details on a very timely topic. Um, I have to admit that I received Ina's presentation yesterday, yeah, uh, 24 hours ago, but it was very, very intensive for the time of my uh, 24 hours. I had a very, very long meeting yesterday. I still have very many meetings out of today. Um, that's why my feedback would be rather short, yeah. Um, yeah, but I'll try to do my best. And I'm very interested to continue our discussions in the near future. Um, I think talking about war, I think it's really very important to go a little bit back. To, uh, the war started not right now. I mean, not one year ago. One year ago, it was a large-scale invasion. The war started earlier. And I also look at my data sets from uh, 2015. I conducted empirical study in Lviv and Lviv region, looking also at different companies, B2B, B2C, different segments, different size. I did not observe any what you call emergency plans, but I do observe some um, concerns among businesses. I saw some concerns among businesses uh, or about uh, the ongoing situation. Um, some businesses said, for example, if the uh, martial law will be implemented, how would we work? How will we proceed? Yeah, um, it was difficult for companies to make any. Uh, plans in a medium perspective. They were able to plan only in a short term perspective. But I also saw one concern about uh, employees, potential new employees. Many businesses at that time were concerned about young people, qualified young people living in the country. And it was really concern, the major concern for many companies at that time. The next uh, study I conducted during the pandemic, um, it was a huge study that was organized by INSEAD, a French business school, and it was a study uh, among um, board chairs in 14 different countries. Um, I was responsible not for Ukraine, I was responsible for Turkey and Germany, but it was a huge study, and I looked at our Ukrainian data set, um, and we found, for example, looking at these 14 different countries, that resistance to the ongoing pandemic was really very good in Turkey, Ukraine, and in Russia. And our explanation was that these companies, that businesses, they grew up in a very difficult conditions. They are able to cope with difficult situation once again, comparing to other countries. For example, it was a very difficult situation in Italy. It was a chaotic situation in Italy. Yeah, and I think looking at the war, I think it probably would be interesting for you to look at the situation in Georgia. Yeah, they also uh, have to difficult or similar situation, not in the size, but also the war and some businesses probably lose their uh, potential situation. And probably to look a little bit at the history, I mean, to look at the situation in Yugoslavia, and uh, probably look a little bit back to the war, and also to look at the situation, the ongoing situation in Israel. It's certainly not the war, but I mean, the military conflict is present in uh, Israel, yeah. 
um, employees might be not on place. Yeah, they have to go to the army. Might have some duties. Yeah, probably to look at the Israel how Israel and companies manage the situation to be in this very difficult situation. Um, as talking about the war, talking about the oligarchs, uh, I can bring uh, one more example to you to consider in the near future. Uh, there are right now a lot of discussions. Um, it's uh, it's not a new topic. It's an old topic, but the war brought this to, to the, this topic to the table once again. And the topic is called reputation laundering. It's like money laundering from corruption studies, but I'm talking about higher education, it's reputation laundering. And it means a bad guy or a group of bad people donate to one particular university. University accepts the donation, and in this way, these bad people uh, whitewash their reputation. They have very good publicity. And you probably know all of these examples. One of the big examples is Dmitry Fertash and his donation to Cambridge University. It was a huge donation. Um, as far as I remember, it was six million yeah, um, uh, donation to Cambridge University to establish Ukrainian studies. The idea was really very good. Um, the, major, the major part of this funding was used to establish Ukrainian studies at Cambridge University that are really very good. And the minor, uh, the minor part of this uh, um, donation, it was for Ukrainian students who would like to study at Cambridge University. The idea was actually very good. Uh, but Dmitry Fertash had very, uh, a lot of legal, legal battles in different countries. Yeah, and in one country, in one legal battle, I think it was in the United Kingdom, uh, it was the battle, the court between him, this oligarch, and Ukrainian newspaper. I have forgotten the name of Ukrainian newspaper. Just a second. It was the battle, and his donation what you, was used in the battle just to show his positive image and his very good intention. It's really very, very difficult topic um, in higher education. Yeah, and it's not only Ukrainian oligarch, it's not only Soviet oligarchs, there are all many other subjects, yeah. Um, talking about informality, informality is certainly stigmatized, yeah, but there are also positive things. I just look um, at, the, at the name of the meeting that took place in May uh, in Berlin, informal meeting of NATO foreign minister in Berlin. And the subject was, the agenda was uh, NATO membership for Finland and Sweden. Yeah, now we have one country in, uh, one new country in NATO. I mean, I just wanted to say that informality is a huge, huge subject. It's not only bad people, yeah. It's also very something positive. Just, uh, if you look also in the United Kingdom, yeah, uh, the queen, uh, she used to meet uh, with every prime minister every week informally and to talk about different things. It's also a very positive example. Um, summing up, informality has very many, many faces, also good faces. Yeah. Um, um, by talking to your um, uh, empirical part, I think it's very, very interesting study. Um, I mean, for the future, or, or right now, if you have enough time, I would like to know, how did you recruit your respondents? Did you travel to the country? Did you conduct your study online? How did you develop the trust? In what languages? I assume it was Ukrainian and Russian, probably, yeah. No language-based mistakes are expected. But I think it's very important if you describe your data set to, to add this information, what questions were asked, what sectors, yeah, et cetera. Uh, yeah. yeah, probably you have your ideas, uh, your theoretical framework, it's political science. I see some political scientists here on the screen, probably they can put something, uh, have some idea, but depending on, on, on what, uh, depending uh, of your target, I mean, uh, uh, depending on your aims, would you like to publish your results? Would you like to publish a new book? Would you like to publish a new chapter in your ongoing book? Would you like to publish a new uh, academic paper? Depending on the field, for example, talking, uh, where would you like to publish? I mean, for example, from business perspective, it's not political economy, but from business perspective, you can you have your uh, empirical data set and look at this empirical data set through the lens of cross-cultural management. 
In business studies, there is a huge topic called cross-cultural management. There are different dimensions. For example, Hofstede is one of the dimensions. Um, Erin Meyer, cultural maps is another dimension. In all dimensions, of all of this theoretical framework, there is one point uh, called uncertainty. Yeah? How people cope, cope with uncertainty. And you have very wonderful example, uh, recent example from the ongoing call. Yeah. But depending on, on your on your targets, yeah. I would like to finish and thank you once again for sharing this very interesting study uh, with all of us on this very timely topic. Thank you very much, Elena. Um, and of course, um, I appreciate a lot that you do, <laughs> were able to do it on this short note. Um, and uh, of course, these are all great, uh, great ideas. Uh, I think I will follow up uh, as regards these business studies. Um, um, in, indeed, uh, so it's. I think I will start with the paper. Uh, but uh, overall, this has the potential to develop into uh, probably my another second book <laughs> for now. Uh, so um, I, I think I will start with a sort of empirical paper that would uh, then um, try to embed this uh, empirical reality uh, into uh, or attach it to different strengths of discipline and first of all to a discipline that I'm uh, uh, familiar with uh, political comparative political economy where the focus in on interaction between business so a kind of uh, business as an actor in society and in the state and interaction with with the state and uh, society uh, but of course, then uh, I'm open to uh, incorporate uh, the studies uh, from other uh, sub disciplines and business studies is probably the first a kind of uh, um, um, realm of uh, academia research that should be looked at. Um, so thank you very much. It, it's very useful. Then um, in, in terms of uh, uh, big business, you know, this was a kind of uh, very long standing topic on my research agenda. And uh, uh, I, I, I'm actually very uh, big proponent uh, uh, of uh, a kind of letting big business to transform uh, instead of fighting uh, this business, because uh, what we know from uh, a kind of previous attempts of the oligarchization that um, the place, uh, the free place of uh, oligarch that is probably uh, somehow prosecuted is very uh, um, fast. Uh, um, a kind of taken by by a new oligarch by a new business so actually this is a kind of wild the oligarchization will just uh, um, uh, kind of replace the faces but the system will remain and sustain and uh, that's why uh, I rather a kind of try to look for some a kind of positive transformation of this big business community or um, individual actors with this business community and see uh, what kind of uh, uh, trends we see there, what forces uh, ignite this transformation and how this positive uh, transformative powers could be probably used by international community or national governments to speed up or to increase uh, uh, this transformation. So unfortunately, in this particular case, in this particular study, it seems like this uh, kind of unfortunate um, crisis or situation of the war uh, speeded up this transformation of big business. But of course, the question remains uh, whether this transformation would be sustainable um, in the post-war uh, context uh, or whether they will return back to their rent-seeking activities and try uh, will try to use their proximity to different state actors to compensate for the losses uh, they experienced during the war. Yes, so, um, and then, um, yes, informality, uh, a kind of totally and normatively uh, 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 disregarded as something that uh, is to 
get rid of. Uh, in um, my research, I also kind of uh, very happy that it goes in line with what you were able to find out uh, through your studies, that it has many positive uh, sides, especially in the situation of our regulation, as we have uh, uh, it in uh, Ukraine, but also in other post-Soviet countries. It helps to uh, make uh, things dumb uh, and uh, yes, and uh, so the, the, certainly there are positive examples how through informality uh, some formal laws were, uh, were possible to be drafted uh, and pretty effectively implemented because there was a kind of informality, informal interaction before, yes, um, or some mistakes in the law could have been corrected because there was quick reaction of business uh, to uh, to one or another a kind of uh, nonsense on the side of the state, and so uh, the situation uh, then could be quickly improved. Yes, uh, yes, I, I think uh, yes. As regards um, um, uh, details on my research, then um, um, actually a lot. Of, so one of uh, elements in the business strategies was internationalization means they tried to uh, kind of to um, uh, open new markets to uh, create established new connections uh, including to western businesses and actually my research benefited a lot from this so there were a lot of uh, raw truths peers uh, that uh, uh, Ukrainian businesses either organized or participated in. And so I was able to meet uh, these businesses, uh, the representatives of uh, Ukrainian businesses directly um, across the Europe. <laughs> and, and then, of course, I relied um, on uh, connections that I had to business through my previous research, so some businesses uh, uh, I uh, was familiar with uh, before, so I tried to connect them uh, because, of, of course, the issue of how to find uh, the people uh, yeah, was a big one, uh, and uh, the field work um, resources uh, of the university uh, was frozen <laughs> for uh, 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 travel to Ukraine. Uh, so um, it, it could not have been could not be used. So I relied in that sense uh, on these occasional uh, possibilities to interview um, businesses in uh, Europe, in Western Europe, but also uh, on uh, interviews via Skype. Yes, and of course I then did it um, Skype or what, whatever other platforms were comfortable for them. And I have uh, semi-structured uh, interviews, means that I had block of questions uh, with uh, prelimi preliminary uh, kind of ideas, what I will ask uh, and what I will uh, kind of pay attention to, but then uh, the conversation was pretty free. Uh, and it was uh, depending on the preferences of uh, respondents, either in Ukrainian or in um, Russian, and then I did not limit myself to uh, a kind of to the sector. In this situation, I tried to kind of to di diversify and have people coming from different uh, sectors of the economy, both and also in terms of size. I uh, talked to small companies, but also to those one who could be regarded as uh, middle or big middle, yes, or companies. Thank you.